us up to date a little bit. Um, we're in some deep, deep parts of the life of David. In fact, um, David is, is in the midst of suffering great um, betrayal, treason. And we're going to find that his son turns on him. We're going to find that, um, I mean, in the next, in this chapter, we're going to probably find four different people that have turned on David and um, are causing him all kind of grief. Now, we can go back and say that, yes, we, we know the sin he committed with Bathsheba and the murder he committed with, with um, Uriah the Hittite, but we can also see that folks are quick to turn on you, yeah. you know. Um, that's why we always have to walk, uh, keep a close walk with God because folk will turn on you and betray you and we can learn many lessons from David. And not only, and, and the thing we're going to learn in this is that when they do it, they do it in a sneaky, underhanded, schemy way. You know, sometimes I, you know, I wish that my battles would be face to face. You want to, you know, you got a problem with me, come to me face to face. Tell me what your issues are. Right or wrong, I respect you because you are, but folk won't do that. That's why Jesus in Matthew chapter 18 said, if you've got an issue with your brother, go to him face to face. If he doesn't hear you, bring two or three witnesses. If they don't hear you and the two or three witnesses, bring the church. And if they don't refuse to hear the church, treat them as an infidel. But you, but folk won't do that. They won't, people won't do the first part. They won't come. They try to do the second and third part. Come on, I want you to go with me to talk to so-and-so. No, come to me face to face. You know, it, it's little things. Man, you stepped on my toe. You stepped on my toe. But what happens is, and in church, somebody step on your toe. Instead of you going to them saying, excuse me, you stepped on. Because sometimes folk will step on your toe and don't. Or did, not only did they didn't mean it, they weren't aware. You know, if I step on your toe, it does not hurt. My foot. Okay, I'm, I'm just using this. If I, if I step on you, it hurts your foot. And it's up to you to say, excuse me, you stepped on my foot. My foot hurts. I may not have been aware that I stepped on your toe. So I'm walking around with hey, all is well because, and, and instead of you coming to me and saying, man, you stepped on my toe and, and it hurts. So I can say, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I stepped on your toe. I'm sorry. I apologize. But you go to somebody else. I can't stand him. He'll step on your toe and won't say nothing. Then you, then you look around while you walk in, everybody looking at you all. Cross-eyed, like, why is everybody, you know, well, we heard that you'll step on somebody's toe. You won't even say nothing. I said, when did I step on somebody's toe? Well, last week you stepped. See, and that's how things, folks should have approached David. Now, we're going to understand this son, Absalom. We find out that Absalom just had some mess in him. He just, Absalom was power-hungry. Absalom was so good looking, he thought the world, the sun, rised and set on him. You know, um, it said last week that his hair, when, you know, he cut his hair once a year and it would be two pounds of hair. And he was tall and handsome. And I think all of that went to his head. But he was conniving, as we're going to see in this next few verses. Let's begin with 2 Samuel chapter 15. It came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rolled up early and stood beside the way of the gate, and it was so that when any man that had a controversy or an issue came to the king for judgment, then Absalom would call them over to him 
and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, The servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See thy matters are good and right, but there is no deputy or no man has been deputized of the king to hear them. In other words, your matter is important, but the king has not appointed anybody to hear them, and apparently he's too busy himself. So I have basically appointed myself. He said, Abelon said, oh, that I were made judge in the land, and every man which have any suit or cause might come to me, and I would take care of him. I'll do him justice. I'll straighten out his situation. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do obsess, you know, Prince Absalom, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. In other words, when somebody came to show deference to him, he would show them, he'd make them feel like they were the most important person on earth. Okay? And it says, and on this manner did Absalom, I still, I, I'm echoing. On this manner did Ec Absalom stole, came, oh, okay. And on this matter did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And it came to pass after, now your Bible may say 40 years. That's an incorrect. That's, that's incorrect. It should say four years. Okay? So I don't know. It was just a mistake that was made. Um, it says, it came to pass after four years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebrew. Now, I want to pause right there for a minute, and we got to get back to David. For some reason, for the last six years, was it six years? Wasn't it two years he was back? How long was um, Absalom back in the last chapter? Seven years. David has been sleepwalking. And I believe that he was so wound up in condemnation and guilt that he just was not thinking straight. You're going to see as we go through this chapter, he's just not. You know, here his son is at the gate of the city, turning the hearts of the people against him for four years, and David don't know it. You know, at some point you will say, you know, what is Absalom? You know, nobody's really bringing no matters to the king anymore. You, you know, you would think he would ask some questions. You know, it's been a month. Nobody, nobody is, is, has a problem that they need the advice of the king. Then somebody will say, well, Absalom been catching them at the gate and taking care of their situation. So that's why they haven't been coming to you. So if something tells me that something is going on with David, that time, three and four years, will pass before he even is aware that a situation is developing that needs his attention. So here he is, four years have passed, and Absalom comes and says, I need to go back to Hebron where I've made a vow. I, I, he's saying I, I, need to do, I need to go back to the church I got baptized in. That's what he's saying. I need to go back to the place where I solidified my relationship with God because I need to restore. I had promised them I would be back and I would make amends and I need to go back there. So David's thinking, okay, he's going back to Hebron to serve the Lord. He said, because verse 8 says, For thy servant vowed a vow while I abode at Geshur in Syria, saying, if the Lord shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. So he has told his father that I'm going back to Hebron to restore, to, 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 to restore a vow, to pay a vow, to, to increase or better or intensify my relationship with God. Are you with me? 
You see how the, the, the story is progressing. And the king said unto him, go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, as soon as you shall hear the sound of the trumpet, then shall you say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. What he was saying, as soon as the word gets out, sent spies out everywhere, because, you know, he done made, he done established for four years, he has established relationships throughout Israel. Now he's going to send some spies out, and when the trumpet sounds, announce that Absalom is king, reigneth, king's reign. So when you hear the trumpet, announce that Absalom is now the king. And with Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem that were called, and they went in their simplicity. What that truly means, and they knew not anything. So he then took 200 men with him to Hebron, but these 200 men have no idea what his plot is. Are you with me? He has not informed them of anything, so they are going innocently. As invited, well, we, you know, we're going with Aphelon. So it's like, it's like a lot of things were going on around but nobody was really, you know, it's like, did it, was anybody suspicious? See, folk, I, I, I just want to share, I, I, can I, see, sometimes people don't like you. Yeah. <laughs> you know why? You know why? But no, and I don't mean it in a bad way. Yeah. But you'll ask a question. Right, uh, you will ask a question. You you know if it if it you know if it walk past you and ain't looking right. Some people say, "Well, that just you'd be like, um, excuse me." <laughs> and and, <laughs> and see people and and it there it should have been you know at some point there is it, there is what they call wise inquisition, questioning. Con they don't like confrontation. But what happens is people don't like somebody that exercises common sense. When somebody walked past, you know, if you saw, you know, like I say, if you saw somebody on fire, you would say, oh, yo, you on fire. You know what I'm saying? If they weren't aware they were on fire. Well, we got people as believers, as mature believers, as leadership, people are on fire. If you look at them in the spirit realm, you see them on fire. In the book of, of, um, of Jude, it says, and some we have to actually pull out of the fire. That's right. So sometimes you have somebody on fire, but we too concerned about hurting somebody's feelings. Don't nobody want to confront nothing. Don't nobody want to, you know, address anything. Well, you know, Absalom, he down there. That's the king's son. You know, he, he probably, I, you know, don't even worry about it. You know, he just down there. And, and the whole time he's setting up a whole kingdom because nobody would question it. You know, four years pass, and, and, and so now he is ready. He has built up inside of the king's kingdom a little mini kingdom, a treacherous, uh, what do they call it when you, treason. He is now committing treason in his own country. He says, and Ab Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor. So now he didn't call for his father's lawyer, counselor, his um, when it's more or less uh, his father's advisor. And from his city, even from Gilo, and he offered sacrifices, and the conspiracy was strong. 
Now it's a conspiracy going on. It's a whole lot of secret underhanded stuff going on. For the people increase continually with Absalom. His circle is growing. There came a messenger to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel are after or with Absalom. And David, this is, you know, like I say, this is, this is what I don't understand. What's going on with David for the last seven years? Really longer than that because two years is, this is four years, then it was three years, then it was two years that he was gone, but it was another two years from the time um, Ab Abnon raped Tamar. So yeah, that was two years. Then Absalom got his revenge, and then he was away for two years. Then he came to Jerusalem for three years, but the king wouldn't see him. Now the king has let him have some freedom in the city. Another four years have passed. And it tells me that during this time, and, I, and you'll see it, something was not right with the man after God's own heart. And I believe what we're going to see right now in this next verse is key. Right. David said to all his servants that were with him, Arise, let us flee. Fear has now completely overtaken the man that wrote Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the light of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though mine enemy, he wrote that. But for some reason, for this nine years period, he, that's why we got to be careful. Yeah, we got to get to the point where we are not sinning. We are no longer openly committing sin, but if you make a mistake, you cannot allow yourself to fall into condemnation to where your relationship with God suffers. If you understand what I'm saying, if you'll notice in this next verse what he should have said or what, what we now know, realize, or being believers understand what should have been said is, hey, we need to pray. We need to seek God's face and find out what the Lord is saying. But he's saying, let's flee. He said, arise, let us flee, for we shall no, not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart. Lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. His own son. He's, he's now fleeing in fear. And the king's servant said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatever the Lord shall appoint. In other words, we will defend the city. We got your back. Why are you running? And the king went forth, and all his household after him, and the king left ten women, which were concubines, to keep the house. Now, <laughs> I believe that part of his problem. Oh, I believe that's a serious part of his problem. You know, it, it, it'll zap your strength. You can't, you know, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his Not ten women concubines, and then you got Abigail, you got um, Bathsheba, you got um, Michael, you, you got a whole bunch of, you got wives and you got concubines. You just, you got too, it's too much, and that's why you can't even hear God. And the king went forth, and all the people after him, and tarried in a place that was far off. And all his servants passed on beside him, and all the Cherethites, and all the Pelethites, 
and the Gittite, 600 men, which came after him from Gath, passed on before the king. These was men that would have, they were ready to fight. They done been through battle after battle since Gath. If you remember when he was in Gath, the first time he went to Gath, he was acting, you know, he had spittle on his beard. The second time he went back to Gath, he was strong. His men had backed him up. They had victory after victory. Now here he is because I truly believe that he is, he, he's not in his right mind because he is not restored. I believe in this nine years, he has not really, really sought God. He repented, but I think he just never really, you know, it's like, and as we'll see in the next couple verses, chapters that finally enough held and broke loose in his life that he just surrenders again. And that's the final time. It says, um, then said the king to Ittai the Gittite, wherefore goest thou also with us? Return to thy place and abide with the king, for thou art a stranger and also in exile. You're not even a member of this church. <laughs> you're not even a child of Israel. You are, you are Hittite. You are Gittite. Why are you even with us? He said, whereas thou came of yesterday, should I this day make thee go up and down with us, seeing I go whither I may return thou? Seeing I go whither I may. In other words, he, the king is saying, I don't really even have no place to stay. And if you stick with me, you're going to be a hindrance. He said, take back thy brethren, mercy and truth be with thee. And Ittai answered the king and said, as the Lord liveth, and as my Lord the king liveth, surely in what place my Lord the king shall be, whether in death or life, even there, also will thy servant be. So you got all of David's friends and, and associates trying to encourage them. Have you ever been in a situation where folk was trying to encourage you, encourage you, but you have been determined to stay in your pity party? That's where I see David now. He's in a pity party. He is, I mean, he is down on himself. So even when people come and say, hey, man, we got your back. Don't worry about it. Get up. Let's go fight. He's like, oh, that's okay. We might well just stay on out here in the wilderness. You know, don't nobody love me or nothing. You know, I'm just all about, you know, he, he you know, and everybody's trying to push him like, man, where is David? Does this sound like the, the, the boy that took down Goliath? Does it? David was like, well, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Have you ever been in a situation where you had victory after victory after victory, then all of a sudden you had a storm or two, now all of a sudden you, 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 you didn't got gun shy. You had victory. You know God's hand in your life. You've seen him do miracles. Then some little bit of adversity show up, and you can't, you, you can't, you can't somehow get it together. That's where David is now. He, he somehow cannot get it together. He don't, he, it's like he don't understand anymore. But the same God that delivered him out of the hand of the Philistine, the same God that delivered him out of the hand of Saul, will still be the same God that could deliver him out of the hand of Absalom if he got his mind right. David said to Ittai, go and pass over, and Ittai the Gittite passed over, and all his men, and with all the little ones that were with him. And all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people passed over. The king also himself passed over the brook Kedron, and all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. So he heading for the wilderness. From the palace to the wilderness, because some adversity has showed up, because the devil has showed up and showed off. This is the king we're talking about. Are we kings and priests? Are we kingdom citizens? Are we, you know, what do we do? Why are we heading for the, why would we go from the palace to the wilderness? Because some adversity show up. 
Can we learn anything from David? And lo Zadok also, and all the Levites with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. He got the ark with him. <sighs> okay. I want y'all to picture this. I want, I want us to go back into, I want you to see the scene. I want you to hear the sounds. I want you to, to smell the, the animals. I want you to hear and, and be there. David has taken all his family, all his faithful people, and they have left Jerusalem and have crossed back over the creek that took them, that he came triumphantly over in with the ark, if you remember. He is now heading back to the wilderness, but in his possession and presence is the ark. What is wrong with that picture? Have we, has he forgotten the story of when the, the, the Levites with the ark, all they had to do when they had the ark on their shoulders the first time they got to Jordan, they said all they did was step a foot into the Jordan and the Jordan separated and rose up in a heap and they were able to cross over on dry land. They didn't have got this story. There was a time when they were between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army. And God said to Moses, have the Levites take, they, no, I'm sorry, I, I don't, I'm about to tell a lie, I'm about to tell a lie. I ain't going to mess up the word because they, they hadn't built the ark yet. When they crossed, but they had the ark built when they crossed the Jordan the first time in victory when they went into Jericho and all the Levites that had the ark stepped one foot into the Jordan River and the Jordan River became dry land so they were able to cross over. So we know the power of the ark. The presence of God, if you got the presence of God with you, if you have the Lord with you, there ought to be nothing to scare you, make, bring fear to you. Make, you know, you, you, you got the presence of God with you. The Ark of the Covenant is with him. But when you, I'm trying to get y'all to see into his mindset. It says, so the Levites were with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God, and they set down the ark of God, and Abathar went up until all the people had done passing out of the city. And the king said to Zadok, carry back. <laughs> Take the ark back into the city. And if I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me again and show me both it and his habitation. In other words, I don't even want the presence of God with me. Like I gotta say, it had to be something going on in David's mindset. As much as he loved the presence of God, as much as he was a worshiper, something had happened in him to cause him to not even want the ark with him. But if he thus say, I have no delight in he, behold, here am I. Woe is me. Let him do to me seemeth good unto him. I'm not worthy of the presence of God. That's what condemnation is. It begins, your own mind begins to tell you you're not worthy of the presence of God. And then you start to discredit the word that you've heard. Lo, I'm with you always, even till the end of the age. I shall never leave you nor forsake you. Behold, I send you another comforter, and he shall be with you and in you. And you, you know what I'm saying? You, 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 when you get into this mindset like David, you forget his word. The king said also unto Zadok the priest, Art thou not a seer, a prophet? Return into the city in peace, and your two sons with you, Ahimaaz thy son, and Jonathan the son of Abishar. 
See, I will tarry in the plain of the wilderness until their word come from you to certify me. So at least now he's at least saying, okay, you're a prophet, and when you hear from God, get word to me, and I'll receive it then. That's why sometimes, you know, when we try to encourage people, don't miss church. That's where you hear, you know, he's saying, prophet, when you get a word from me, send it so I can receive it. Do you understand what, he, what he's saying? See, I will tarry in the plain in the wilderness until I, a word come from you to certify me. Zadok, therefore, and Abathar carried the ark of God back into Jerusalem, and they tarried there. Now, David went up by the ascent of Mount Olivet and wept as he went up. I'm going to read this in a better way for you to understand it so you can find out what happened the night Jesus was betrayed. David went up the Mount of Olives. That's what that Mount Olivet is, the Mount of Olives. And had his head covered, and he went barefoot, and all the people that was with him covered every man his head, and they went up weeping as they went. And one told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, boom, his mind is coming back now. Oh, maybe I should pray. You know what I'm saying? Now he done found out that his 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 confidant, his advisor has now turned his back on him and finally it's gone on. He's sent away the ark. He's, he's asked him, send me a word. You know, folk run around looking for a word. And finally, when it looks like everybody has turned against him that he thought was important, he finally prays. And you see where, is that what it says in your Bible? He says, O Lord, I pray thee. Turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Now he's praying. That's what he should have done for he ran and flee. And it came to pass that when David was come up to the top of the mount where he worshipped God, so now he didn't Pray and worship. Behold, Hushai the archite came to meet him with his coat rent and earth upon his head. Unto whom David said, If thou passest on with me, thy, then thou shalt be a burden to me. But if thou return to the city... And say to Absalom, I will be thy servant, O king, as I have been thy father's servant hitherto. So will I now also be thy servant. Then mayest thou for me defeat the counsel of Ahithophel. So now David is getting this schemy. Okay, and I'm going to send me this. He sent the, the, the ark. He's sending some spies back into the city. You go tell him that you'll work for him the way you work for me. Uh, he going to fall for it because, you know, right now Absalom is operating in supreme arrogancy. So when somebody come and pump up his flesh, he going to jump right on it. Oh, you the man. I'm going to be with you. I was with your daddy, but I see you the man now, so I'm going to be with you. Okay. So he'll bring, he, he know David realize he's going to open the door for him because right now he's operating in arrogancy and pride. And hast thou not there with thee Zadok and Abathar the priests? Therefore it shall be that what thing soever thou shalt hear out of the king's house, thou shalt tell it to Zadok and Abathar the priests. Behold, they have there with them their two sons, Ahimeaz Zadok's sons, and Jonathan Abathar's son, and by them you shall send me 
unto me everything that you can hear. Now you notice that after he prays and worships, his strategy now changes. Now he's becoming more assertive in dealing with the situation. When his first um, instinct was to flee, but now he has prayed and worship, and now because he prayed and worshiped, I believe now God is bringing him strategies back to re get restored as king. Behold, they have their, and he says, so Hushai, David's friend, came unto the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. Verse 37 says, at the same time um, Hushai came in the city, so did Absalom. So now Absalom has returned to the city, and now he is in Jerusalem where he is claiming the throne of Israel. Amen? So I know there was a lot in here, and I'm going to open it up. Um, I want as much comments and, and, and as, as possible um, because I think it's a whole lot in here. You know, and I kind of, I hope I express some things, but I'm going to open it up for questions, answers, and um, let's just see what else y'all see in, in this word. Amen.